Welcome, my name is David Malone. I have the privilege of working at the UN University, which is headquartered in Tokyo, from where uh, today we are receiving a guest in our public conversation series who has just published a book with several others and a number of distinguished authors. And the book is on Japan's aid program. My guest is Hiroshi Kato, uh, vice president of uh, the Japanese aid program known as JICA. Uh, he's been with JICA on and off for many years. He was actually a student of history here in Japan. He later graduated from Harvard University um, he's been working in and thinking about international assistance programs most of his adult life. And I'm delighted to say that the book is profoundly interesting. Why is it interesting? Uh, this is it. Um, it's interesting because for many years in the West, uh, there was the belief that uh, the West had invented aid, the West knew how to do aid, and Western uh, business models for aid programs and also the objectives of Western aid programs were self-evidently wonderful, or if not wonderful, at least the best. And Japan had a very different model for its aid program, and I think in the donor community must always have felt a little lonely in defending the value of its aid program. Ten years ago, I went to live in India, and in India I discovered that the Indian public, uh, those aware of aid programs and what they were able to contribute to India, actually had a very high opinion of Japan as a country, and when they were asked why they had a high opinion of Japan as a country, they cited the aid program. And when they were asked, well, why is the aid program so wonderful? They said, because of infrastructure. And that was actually revelatory of something important about Japan's aid pro program that we'll discuss a little bit further. But first, Hiroshi, uh, you joined uh, JICA really at the beginning of your career, and you've stayed with it, which nowadays is unusual. So you must have been very committed to it. And I wanted to ask you, as a student of history, mm -hmm. what made you want to join JICA? What was the driver of your decision? Well, David, thank you for the question, and thank you for having me, first of all. Well, to respond to your question, uh, to if I can be totally honest with you, I wasn't so much committed to the development issue when I made a decision to join JICA in 1978. Before that, I was studying uh, Asian history and particularly Korean history. And I started my study focusing on the 36 years that Japan colonized Korea. And later, uh, my interest shifted from the modern Korean history to the medieval history. But in, in, the, uh, in addition to my studies uh, on Korea and Korean Peninsula, I was forced or I was compelled or I was encouraged to study various subjects of Asian countries, uh, histories of Asian countries. So that made me uh, rather knowledgeable about what, how Japan uh, interacted with uh, a number of Asian countries. We did some good things, some bad things, but in total, we, uh, I realized that Japan had a lot to learn and a lot to uh, contribute to uh, Asian countries. And uh, it was that kind of vague idea I had in my, in my mind when, when I was nearly completed uh, uh, my graduation thesis. And I was looking around the campus and look at a spotted uh, announcement uh, from JICA uh, that they are looking for uh, some people to work for the organization. Ah, and I thought this might be a good, interesting uh, organization to work for. And I studied a little bit about the what they call official development assistance. And I learned that the official development assistance at that time was uh, growing rapidly, and it's going to be a major uh, instrument of the Japanese government to deal with uh, uh, developing countries, and particularly with Asian countries. So I thought maybe joining JICA would be an interesting idea. 
And after, it is only after that that I developed my serious thinking and philosophy and accumulated experience. So at the very beginning, I must confess, I wasn't a very committed you know, um, candidate to uh, apply for the JICA Entrance Kingdom Nation. Well, I think a lot of us were like that at the <laughs> beginning of our careers. Happenstance was important. When you first joined JICA, and perhaps earlier also, what were the driving ideas behind the aid program? What was it seeking to achieve, and how was it seeking to achieve it? When I, I joined JICA, mm. well, in the early period of my days at, at JICA, well, uh, I joined in 1978, as I said, and it was a time of rapid expansion of Japan's ODA. And uh, major, major emphasis was how to strengthen JICA's uh, programs vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN member countries. So uh, annual budget increased very rapidly, and the, uh, my bosses and the super bosses were very busy in identifying new projects. So at that time, it was a time of rapid expansion of Japan's ODA, and everybody was uh, you know, busy uh, how to uh, expand the program, mm -hmm. especially to uh, uh, Asian countries. But another thing is that uh, late uh, mid-70s is a period when the Japanese uh, economy was still affected by the uh, crisis or uh, impact of the oil crisis that happened in 1973 uh, and 74. And uh, the government was still trying to uh, uh, do more to uh, enhance its energy security. And it was at that time that Japan was ex uh, shifting, not only from uh, uh, shifting its efforts, not shifting, but adding, in addition to Asia, Southeast and Asian countries, they are looking for uh, the expansion of its program to other countries, like energy-rich countries in uh, Mid Middle East countries. So it was a uh, rapid expansion to s Southeast Asia, and at the same time, expansion of other areas, partner countries, like in uh, Middle East countries. And as a newcomer, as a uh, young uh, of staff member of JICA, I was, you know, busy just, you know, uh, fulfilling my responsibility as I was told by my bosses. Mm. But things, uh, of course, changed, and uh, your book looks back uh, it, with great historical sweep, again, the historian in you comes out. Uh, but there are certain constants in the aid program the book brings out very clearly. And one is to bring together development objectives elsewhere with private sector initiative and mm -hmm. experience. Mm. And this was uh, practiced also by some of the Western countries in a way the United States uh, had a similar mix, but did not advertise it in quite the same way. Japan's model was unique in that it linked private sector development to the overall development of the mm. economy of mm. developing countries mm. in a way that was much franker, uh, much clearer about its programming, than some of the Western countries. And I wanted to ask you whether that was a result of Japan's economic miracle, the dynamism of its own private sector, how much it wanted to expand into the developing world, or were there other factors as well? Hmm. Well, that is a very difficult question, and uh, I need <laughs> to think about it carefully. But maybe my uh, immediate answer is that uh, uh, the conviction that any country needs infrastructure and the private sector driven uh, development uh, for its development is a conviction that Japan has cherished uh, out of its own uh, history of development. And uh, many people, especially in the West, perhaps um, might have seen in the past the strong emphasis, Japan's strong emphasis on infrastructure as a kind of a mercantilistic uh, orientation, but I'm not persuaded by that opinion. And the strong emphasis on infrastructure and strong emphasis on human resource development funded by uh, the uh, pu uh, public uh, funds uh, is uh, aimed to, to be coordinated 
with the private sector uh, activities. In other words, what we aimed at is to uh, strengthen infrastructure and uh, people's skills levels through publicly funded projects like ODA uh, on the one hand and, and to coordinate that with the private sector uh, activities. And that was actually what we uh, experienced through our own uh, history of development. And the, what we wanted to do is to replicate what we experienced in other countries and particularly in Southeast Asian countries. And meanwhile, Korea mm -hmm. and Taiwan and eventually China yes. were busy replicating the Japanese model also. And each of them were very successful in replicating it. Mm -hmm. So there were good reasons to believe that the model might apply not only to Japan, mm -hmm. but to other countries as well. Yes, those that uh, our neighbors and partners like China and Korea, uh, I don't think they have publicly admitted that they have learned something from Japan, but may, uh, some of the authors in, who contributed a chapter to this mm -hmm. book uh, conclude that there must have been some, you know, uh, learning process between the uh, three, Japan, Korea, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and China. And so, oh, I think they have, there was a kind of uh, a mutual learning process between the, among the three countries. And we see today in India, a country where I lived and, and which I much love, that uh, in thinking about accelerated development for the country, in the future, pretty well everybody agrees that the biggest deficit is infrastructure mm -hmm. and what is needed most urgently now is better infrastructure. If the process of industrialization the Prime Minister talks about, Mr. Modi advocates, mm -hmm. it can only succeed if infrastructure improves. So India has come rather late to the conclusion, but that draws it very close to the Japan experience. Mm. Yes, I fully agree, uh, David. And um, one of the things that we, uh, Japan, did in, in the process leading toward the ad adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals is to highlight the importance of infrastructure and the private sector-led growth supported by sufficient infrastructure development. And when you compare, uh, say, Asian countries and some, say, poorer countries like in Africa, the sh you can see the sharp contrast between the amount of stock of infrastructure they have. In Asia, they have a rich, you know, uh, abundant stock of infrastructure, whereas in other African countries or some other countries, well, th th they uh, clearly reveal a strong uh, deficiency or deficit of infrastructure. And uh, I think uh, uh, emphasis on infrastructure, uh, uh, Japan has been a uh, kind of lonely advocate <laughs> of infrastructure in the, uh, through 1980s and 90s and early 2000s. But it seems that all the leaders in, uh, in the international development community have, have come to agree and, and acknowledge the importance of infrastructure. So we're very happy that we are you know, sharing a same view mm -hmm. as the uh, infrastructure, as the fundamental factor for uh, economic development. I also think that your belief in private sector driven involvement in uh, infrastructure has come into its own because for many years governments tried to uh, provide infrastructure and although it worked in some cases, it was either too expensive, too slow, uh, you know, too corrupt in many cases. And ultimately, most countries have now reached the conclusion mm -hmm. that the private sector is the way to go, as had been advocated all along by Japan. Yes, yes, ex that exactly. And uh, maybe one of the differences between in the Sustainable Development Goals adopted last year in the Millennium Development Goals, which was adopted at the turn of the century, is that you know they have recognized the importance of economic growth, and they have explicitly uh, articulated the importance of uh, infrastructure as, as you know uh, uh, f f in indispensable factor to promote the private sector development. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So coming to today, uh, this book, which was obviously something you had, uh, you and your co-editors had, had been thinking about for a while, how did you structure it and what did you think was important to emphasize about Japan's uh, development program from a historical perspective? Mm. Well, there are several things that I wanted to uh, have highlighted in the book. One is to have a long-term overview of uh, the history, the entire 60-year history of Japan's ODA. You know, maybe one can look at uh, and evaluate a country's ODA uh, looking at a spot uh, and taking a, a shot, uh, one shot uh, picture, but that is not uh, uh, the right way to evaluate a program uh, of that has lasted for an extended period of 60 years. So long-term perspective is one thing. And another thing is to, uh, I'd like to mix different perspectives, both from the academic people and the practitioners' uh, viewpoints, that's one thing, and the perspectives of the Japanese people and the uh, views of the outside uh, observers, that's one thing. And uh, we also uh, make sh made sure that the uh, contributors come from different parts of the world. Some come from Japan, and some from the US, some from Europe, and some from Africa, and some from Australia. So this kind of diversity in, in the lineup of uh, authors was something I had in mind when I started this mm -hmm. book. And it's very unusual for essentially an academic book to be discussed quite a bit. But the other day I was looking at something online only to stumble on a discussion of this book. So uh, for European North American uh, scholars, experts, practitioners mm -hmm. of development assistance, mm -hmm. uh, the book is now uh, a very interesting reference point because uh, it does point to a number of things the West had thought were wrong with Japan's aid mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. but turn out to have been right rather than wrong. So in a way, the long view is very helpful in this, and uh, that was part of the discussion, that mm -hmm. uh, long-term assessment mm -hmm. uh, was useful. For our viewers online, um, this will be a discussion we'll be haven, having this evening with an audience here at the university. The discussion will really belong to the audience and uh, Hiroshi. Uh, it's a subject of real interest in Japan because Japan's been spending a lot of money on uh, development assistance. And also I think Japanese pride themselves on wanting to provide assistance to less fortunate countries. And so it's a combination of um, quite a lot of money involved, good intentions involved, uh, actual programming decisions that Japanese citizens are interested in that I think will attract an excellent audience for our conversation. I'm very glad that some of you will have been able to join us online for a brief preview of what we'll be touching on this evening. Hiroshi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.